Good morning, industry explorers, or actually good evening from where I'm at. I think morning just means it's time to start anew. There's a lot of optimism with morning. So even though it's evening, I always say good morning. Anyway, welcome to another episode of our live stream series. My name is Siobhan Colleen, and today we've got Tony Taylor. Tony, how are you? I am doing excellent, even better now that we're talking about one of my favorite subjects. Perfect. Now, I've decided that this is going to be a thing now. I want to know your life story in two minutes. Are you ready? Ooh, two minutes. How about two days? <laughs> no, two minutes and go. All right, good deal. I'm glad that you didn't warn me beforehand, so I would have I crafted something like beautiful. But, <laughs> but really quick, um, I'm from Gary, Indiana, uh, born and raised Gary, Indiana, Midwest, uh, product of a single uh, mom or single parent home. I've uh, been through ups and downs. And I just right now I am on this journey, this journey, not just for myself, but for others uh, to find that inspiration and not false motivation, but that inspiration within themselves. Uh, right now, I work as a uh, inspirational speaker and also uh, a recruiter. And that's pretty much it. I did it in less time than I needed. So, uh, hold on. You didn't even mention your military experience, and I know you're a veteran. Yeah, I am. I am. I am a, a, a veteran. A huh? <laughs> you skipped a over lot. a lot. Okay, you got a minute left. All right, good deal. Yeah, I was. I was in the, the Marine Corps for quite a bit. I also worked for uh, the Department of Defense, Fire Department, and uh, worked in safety quite a bit. And that's pretty much it. I don't even believe it. I don't even believe it. All right. Tell me what you do with Tony Taylor Inspires. So with Tony Taylor Inspires, um, what it is, is uh, I like the word inspire instead of motivational, motivational speaker. So pretty much what I do uh, right now because of COVID, uh, most of my presentations are uh, kind of like this uh, through Zoom, but I'm speaking uh, to companies. I'm speaking to individuals. It could be one all the way up until probably about 5,000. That's been the biggest crowd uh, that we've had during COVID. But nice. um, it's mainly just inspiring those that have that spark in spot inside of them, inspiring those just to keep going. And that's time. Just, just like you inspired me to keep going. I'm not good at talking about myself. I'd rather talk about everybody else. <laughs> but we're here to talk about interview strategy. All right, all right, right all right, all right. So a big part of interviewing is first impressions. So let's talk about that. Question for you. Mm -hmm. What is your first impression with this outfit? With like how it. I'm presenting myself. I like it. We're going to be honest too, right? I, I'm not going to. Yes, absolute honesty. <laughs> I like You're that. You're a recruiter. All right, I cool. walk into your door for an interview wearing this. What do you think about me? I believe in being uh, caring, caring and being candid at the same time. Um, so what I would say as a recruiter, you walked into my office. This is you. If you walked in my office with jeans on, I would be all good at it because that's you presenting who you are. You being your authentic self. I am not the typical recruiter or not the typical executive that's going to judge you by what you have on. It's more uh, what is up there, right? Mm -hmm. And what is in here uh, that I care about. And I think uh, there's a big movement right now in corporate America that's going towards that. So I would say first impression, spot on. Nice. Does it communicate a mess message? If there was a two sentence message or even a one sentence message about this, what would it say? I'll give you a word prepared. Nice. Prepared. I know you didn't wake up like that, right? You, you, you got up, you, <laughs> you know, you got the blazer on. It says business. It says that you care about this interview. Yeah. And, so I, I and we were on that. time too. You're on time too. So that says a lot. Good, good. So being on time is important and looking prepared is important. I got to tell you something. I did my officer interview for the Army wearing this. Did you really? 
I did. And I didn't want to go with a black blazer. I didn't want to go with a white blazer because to me that was too cliche. That's what right. everybody wears. So right. I'm like, I'll go for something different. And I saw this color and I go, yeah, it's different. It's unique. I'm going to stand out. And of course, you got I, was it only, too. I was the only female there. So yeah. I already stood out. Um, yeah. long, long story short, long, long, long story short, I got accepted, got delayed entry. Right as I was about to swear in, there was a complication at MEPS. It was totally my fault. And I wasn't able to go. And then COVID happened. Yay. So oh, enough so about me. Is, this is recently. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is like within the past year. Oh, wow. So, yeah. But anyway, so first impressions, it is important to, I've seen that people have a first impression within the first 10 seconds or even 30 seconds of seeing someone. And it doesn't right. mean that someone's making a negative judgment about you. They're just yeah. analyzing what it is they're seeing. Just like how when you see a tree on the side of the road, you're processing that information. So when you walk into an interviewer's office, they are processing the information in front of them. So try to give them something good. But you are different, Tony. You care about what's up here. Right. So do you have any other words on interview strategies or do you want to get into the, the meat of it? Yeah. So so with first impressions, right? We're first impressions. So this is and, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, probably about seven, seven months ago, I had the lady at the front at the front desk. I had already pretty much selected a candidate, right? But I had the lady at the front that she said, oh my God, Tony, you got to come up here right now. So I dropped what I was doing and I went up there immediately. And she said, hey, I have this resume. It's only a half a page. There was a jelly stain on it, right? <laughs> There's a jelly stain on oh, it. Oh, so, man. So she gave it to me and I was just kind of like, oh, oh okay, <laughs> awesome, oh. right? Right. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll and I'll be real with you. I immediately was just like, come on, who would drop this off? Go, you know, like, it wasn't a time thing. You didn't have to be at my office at a certain time. I didn't even know about you, but you dropped it off. So I was getting ready to go and just do whatever I was going to do with it. Maybe round file it. I'll be candid. And I turned around and I said. This person, tell me about this person. She said different. She said he, she used my buzzword. I can tell that she liked them because she, she said he was kind. And I go, what do you mean by, what do you mean by kind? She says, most people, they open the door and they do, they drop their resume at me. And I go, really? That really happened? She goes, no, he was very kind. He's very courteous. He asked to speak to the hiring manager. He asked about you. He asked, were you nice? He asked that I like working here. And I'm like, this dude sounds like me. And I called him and offered him the job. And he was amazing. Jelly stain and all. He Love was amazing. It. Yeah. So uh, definitely, I would say first impression is treat everybody with respect because I was always told that whoever the hiring manager is, if they're doing their job and they're doing their due diligence, besides making sure that your degree and everything like that is squared away, right? They're doing their due diligence. They're going to go and they're going to ask the person at the door, how were you? They're going to ask the person that mm. took you around and showed you the place, the person that gave you your water. Did, did, did he or she or they, did they say thank you, right? And that's really big with me. I always ask that question. How did they do? How did they treat you? Yeah, I really, really appreciate you saying that. And that's something that even I don't think about all the time is your interview starts before you even walk into the door. Your interview yeah. starts when when people are when people can see you, right? Yeah. Your yeah. interview doesn't start when you're singing in the shower. Thank right. God I have that privacy. But <laughs> if you're in public, like you never know if the person who's going to interview you is getting a coffee in the same shop as you. You don't know if the person who's going to interview you or potentially hire you is going to talk to the receptionist or talk to whoever else interacted with you. Tony, yeah. that is such an important yeah. thing for people to remember is that your interview starts before you walk through the door. Yeah. And also one thing that I forgot is, uh, and, and this is maybe getting into the weeds a little bit too much, but 
I always pay attention to where that person parks as well. Really? Yeah, where where they park. Are they going to park? Are they going to back in right in front of the door and smoke everybody out? out? Are they going to be courteous and park and park where we ask them to park? You know, how wow. are they interacting on the way inside of the building? So I, so I think everything, everything is important. And I'm not saying these are like deal breakers. I'm just saying these are just things to consider and to be mindful of the person that's going in for that job. Wow. Yeah, you that is incredible. I have no idea how many recruiters think the way that you do, but I think that is really important to be mindful of everything that you're doing. I like that. I like that. And you know what? That makes for a very courteous society. If we just yeah. all acted like we were on our way to an interview. I think so. I think so. I agree. I agree. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. All right. Or interview so, that you really uh, interview for a job that you really want. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So, so you, you've parked, you've mm -hmm. parked, you walked through the door, you greeted everybody and now you're in the office. I don't, oh. so, so now first impression time is over, right? Mm -hmm. What is this? Just tell me about what this is like for, from your perspective, because from my perspective, I'm thinking about my answers, you know, to the typical interview questions. I'm thinking about my previous job experience and I'm thinking about interesting stories to tell that are going to somehow relate to the job that I'm trying to get. Right. That's my experience as someone who's going in for an interview. But once the first impression is over, what is it like from your perspective? From my perspective, yeah. and this is, and this comes be, before I even start recruiting, I, I'll tell you one thing. When I got out of the, the Marine Corps, I couldn't find a job to save my life, right? Couldn't find a job to save my life. So I went on a bunch of different interviews, bunch of different, I mean, hundreds. I wasn't doing it right. Okay. So that's me coming from the other side of the table. And I always think about that. How does that person feel? That person is nervous. So you know what? I'm going to get the best out of them. I'm going to tell them to relax, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not going to grill them. I, I'm not going to grill them. If they're nervous, I'm not going to have a panel of eight people that's going to come in and play stump the chump. We're not going to do that because I want to know this person because I'm going to be this person you know, if, especially if it's somebody that's going to be working with me, right? They're going to be working mm -hmm. with me. So I want to know who they are. Not, mm -hmm. not the, oh my God, I'm nervous and I'm being beat up. So I take the time and I ask them thoughtful questions. Who are you? The minute that they start, they say, well, I'm in safety or I'm an HRF. No, 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 no. Who are you? Right? Who are you? I ask those questions. Who are you? Some, they'll say they're a mother, they're, they're a father. Right. And that's no right or wrong answer. Mm -hmm. There's no right or wrong answer. And the what I would give them right from the person that's answering those questions is, yes, all of that information, all of that information is important as far as the stories that you're going to have, as far as being relatable. But just as you're being interviewed for that position, you're interviewing them. So, yes. And that. That was a game changer for me. That was a game changer for me because my questions changed. The questions that I asked the recruiter, everything changed for me. Once I said, you know what? I don't even know if I, this job, I'm very interested in it. I'm very curious in this job. And I use that word, I'm curious. But I'm going because I want to see if it's a good fit, not just for them, the organization, but a good fit for me, right? So I want to backtrack just a little mm -hmm. bit. You mentioned that you're not going to grill some as a recruiter, you're not going to grill somebody and try to make them feel nervous under pressure. You're trying to alleviate that so that you can really get to know who they are and really find out if they're a good fit for your company. What do you think about jobs where it is a high stress environment like the military or like a really, you know, really up there corporate position? Right. I would say the the jobs that are stressful, that are stressful environments. I mean, coming but out. Should, and, you grill, and, should you grill interviewees to see if they can handle it? I don't think so. I don't I don't think so. And I, and I think just like going into the military. Right. 
when you go into the military, your your recruiter, right, that you had, um, he or she, they were nice to you, right? They didn't, they wanted you to feel like you're invited. They mm -hmm. told you, yeah, when you go to boot camp, it's going to be rough. And they gave you different scenarios. They they prepared you. They didn't just, because you, I mean, I don't want to work for mean people, right? And I don't want to be a part of an organization that's mean. High stressful is one thing, but I want to make sure that if I'm working for a company that is high stress, I want to make sure that this person that's across the that across the table from me that they have my back. And bullying me, or and I use the term bully. I that's lack of better words, but being aggressive, that to me that doesn't that doesn't work. That doesn't work for me. Even in combat situations, right? Your leaders that are getting you ready for combat, they're not going to be aggressive. They're going to show you that they care first, and that's what's important as a leader, as a recruiter, anybody that's that person that's welcoming them, welcoming that potential employee inside the door is that they are being welcoming and they're explaining to you the culture of the organization. Yeah, the culture of the organization is definitely really important because as an interviewer, you want to make sure someone's going to be a good fit. And now let's switch from the recruiter's perspective momentarily to the interviewee's perspective. You're also interviewing the employer. You're also trying to figure out if they're a good fit for you. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so, my, go ahead. I'm go sorry. Ahead. <laughs> Your show. <laughs> oh, no, I just, you know, I, I think that's a really good point to make, but I don't want to since we're talking about it from the recruiter's perspective, I, I want to ask you if you ever think about the opportunity for your future, potentially future employees to receive training. What if I'm an employee, what if I'm coming to you for an interview and I say, look, this is my experience. It's similar to this, but I don't have that certification or I don't have experience with that particular program but I'm willing to learn. Does that speak volumes to you as a recruiter? Yes, yes, it does. As a recruiter and also, you know, the, the person that will be working or managing that person, because I these a lot of these job descriptions, they have a long list that probably didn't even come from the person, right? A long list of all these requirements that probably didn't come from the person that they'll even be working for, right? So, as a recruiter, I'm making sure that they have those core skills, those core skills. Are they friendly? Are they able to grasp this in the amount of time that we need them to grasp it? But I will probably put in a caveat. Yes, if you have to have this course to work in that job, you know, hey, we, we want to make sure that, you, that you're able to get it in, a, in six months. Have you ever looked at the curriculum? Do you think that you would be a good candidate for that course, right? Um, because we, we can't expect for that person to, you know, come into the job and be willing to do it, do the job day one, right? We owe them, we have that responsibility to train them up. And I'm not saying you have, you know, somebody that's in a nurse's position, right? They come in and, you know, they're a CNA and we say, hey, we're gonna give you four or five years to, to get there. I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. saying, you know, those kind of jobs, but uh, definitely somebody that's, that's, that's close. Right. So you mentioned like, I'm going to receive that certification within six months or so. And I've actually, inter I've, I've applied for jobs where I didn't have a certification that I needed, but I offered to attain it within, I don't remember if it was a six month period or a nine month period, something along those lines. Um, so I would say, based on what you said, a good interview strategy is to look at the job description. Are there certifications or certain kinds of experience required? If it happens to be a certification, look at the curriculum and prepare right. yourself to be able to talk about it or definitely, definitely prepare to talk about the curriculum, right? Right. And if you can speak professionally about it, bonus. That's super awesome. And I feel that would that gives the recruiter a sense that you are going to be able to pass the test for that certification. And right. if you can't speak on every part of the curriculum professionally, 
but you kind of can and you're willing to learn, then again, it seems that that might give the recruiter some security in knowing that you have the aptitude and the drive right. to attain something that's going to contribute to the company. Yep, 100%. And uh, another thing for your listeners to keep in mind, a lot of the recruiters, right? A lot of the recruiters, they don't have that lead way to, to bypass that stuff because they have a bunch of different candidates, right? Mm -hmm. And a bunch of different candidates and also a bunch of different requisitions that they have to get filled. So what I would do, and this is a hack that I started doing after you know being told several times, oh, you don't have this cert. Okay, thanks. We'll call you. And then they never do. But what I would say is uh, like, you know, going the, the thing that I can think about right now is let's say you're going for a position and it requires you to have, let's say, an EMT or first aid. Let's just say first aid because of a lot, a lot of positions, especially in construction, they require first aid. So what I would do is look at the job, look at the job posting, go and find a first aid course, right, and get the, get the certification, right, and if it's something a little bit more extensive then first they register for the course. Mm -hmm. I am registered for the course. The course is going to be in less than 30 days or maybe even before you hire me, right? Before you hire me, because as a recruiter, that's going to my brain. Okay, if we hire him, we give him, okay, I can, okay, I'm going to put he has it, he or she has it, right? Or they're working on getting it. So you've leaped that hurdle and it's on to the next. So- mm -hmm. The main thing is enroll in the course, know what the curriculum is, and then you'll be good to go. Yeah, that's a really good strategy. And then even if you don't get hired for that position, if you're going for other positions that are similar and they all require that certification, well, if you strike out with one employer, then the next couple of employers might yeah. consider you or even hire you based on the certification right. that you acquired. So I think it's, it's, don't be afraid of that process. Don't be afraid, don't be afraid of any process really. So it's one thing to interview for, for a job. And if you have a certification, great, but if you don't just go for it, right. especially if that's like the industry or the field that you're trying to get into, just go for those certifications. Right. Study up. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. the other folks that are applying for that job, they're no better than you. Everybody out there, they're they're lacking something. You're not going to get a candidate that's going to have 100%. So don't let that deter you away from hit and submit. Okay, so let's talk about some do's and don'ts for interviewing. Mm. I guess I would say do, do dress for the job right? Just dress for the job because there's a lot of recruiters. They're not going to be like me. You know, there's somebody you can come in sandals and I'd be like, oh, he's, he's, I'll look at the positives and be like, okay, I, I see what you're doing here. Right. But there's some recruiters that they'll, like I said, they'll judge you. They're judging. Judge, judge, judge. I would not hire someone with wearing sandals to a job interview. <laughs> and, I, right. and I come from a pretty relaxed industry, and most of my interviews have been in jeans and a polo black mm -hmm. T-shirt. I I've only worn a very formal outfit like this, and it was for the military. Um, yeah. But other than that, any other interview I've been to was business casual. But if someone walked in with sandals, I'd be like, get out of here. We, yeah. we work on job sites. We work with steel toed shoes. Like get those sandals out of here. No, exactly. And that's, <laughs> and that's, and that's why you have to dress for the job, right? right? You have to dress for the job. So if you know that it's a construction site, you know, me, my background being in safety, I'm going to ask you, okay, what kind of footwear do you normally wear? Right. But out here in the Pacific Northwest, I mean, it's, it's really, it's cold right now, but you'll see some of the smartest people, right? Walking around with sandals, shorts, right? Yeah. It's just a different, it's just a different coach and it depends on wherever you're at. Me personally, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I wouldn't what, do it, but. What's one of your pet peeves during interviews? I would say being too cocky. I definitely would say that's a, that's a don't, you don't want to be too cocky. 
Um, you don't want to seem like a know-it-all, unless that's just who you are. If that's who you are, then by all means, let them see you know your authentic self, right? Um, I would say another pet peeve is um, lying, right? If you don't have a certain certification, mm -hmm. right? Just like I said, recruiters they have criterias, and you know these companies they spend a lot of money vetting candidates. So what happens once they vet, once we vet a candidate and things come back, you know, on their record or, you know, they've said that they've had, you know, experience in certain arenas and we find out that they don't, it's, you know, you've potentially, you've, um, I don't know, you've, you've might have messed up the person that was behind you, right? Because now we're on a timeline and we have to hurry up. So um, I would definitely say that's, that is, uh, don't don't lie. Be honest. Be straightforward. And if you if they're not going to hire you, I mean, they just weren't ready to receive you. It just wasn't your time right now for that position. Right. And I think that's the good mind frame that we need to be in, because there are certain jobs that we just can't do. I cannot go and be a scientist. Right. I just I just can't do it. I can go and apply and be a scientist and lie and put a bunch of stuff. But what happens when I have to go and do the scientist stuff? Right, yeah. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. So, yeah. yeah, another don't. I would say swearing. Mm. That's a big one. I I have a potty mouth. Right, I was in the Marine Corps for a very long time. I have a potty mouth. However, it's one of those things that it's just you don't go on a job interview and swear. You just. It's definitely a don't. You want to yeah. be positive, right? You want to mm -hmm. be positive. You want to be upbeat. You don't want to trash your current or former employee, employee, employer. That's definitely a don't. That's you a good one. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like it's like going on a relationship. Like it's starting a relationship. You go on a date mm -hmm. and you sit down because this is, they were sizing each other up, right? Okay. How do you look? <laughs> How do you? Okay, okay, everything's good. Everything's good. Okay, resume checked out. Okay. Now all you want to do is talk about your ex boyfriend or your ex wife, and it's Red just like, yeah, like I'm. So it's everybody else's fault except for yours. Okay. Right. And what I'm gonna say is I'm good. <laughs> so yeah, definitely. That's definitely a don't. Uh, follow Tony Taylor inspires for relationship advice. As well. There we go. There we go. I'm here all night. <laughs> call Tony when you're on your next Tinder date. <laughs> or you go to your next interview. <laughs> yeah, there we go. And, uh, and and that's good. Honestly, you can tell them to, to call me and reach out to me as far as um, not just interview strategies. I'm not going to send them like a PDF or anything like that. If they want to have an interview, which I've done this with several, um, several folks that were getting out of the military, we did an interview and, you know, we recorded it and I coached them through it. And of course I sent the, but the employer, right. The edited it version, but I'm willing to help anybody that wants to go through that. Um, I definitely think it's beneficial because I mean, we're living in a world of technology, right? That kind of stuff helps a lot. And there's a lot of people that they're not used to being interviewed. And that's one of the things, just like, like I told you before we started, I am naturally not good at, at saying, hi, I'm Tony, I'm an expert at this. I'm a guru at this. Everybody else might say it, but I have a problem with saying that so as far as yeah and yeah and it's to a fault because that's why i didn't get a lot of jobs before because they would say tell me something good about yourself and i'm just thinking like what <laughs> but you have to coach yourself up to where you know how to throw out those tangibles without sounding so cocky right so. Okay, so I definitely have two follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. Number one, how do you not be cocky? I would say that's hard because 
A lot and of times. I will, and I will admit, I have struggled with this because I've always been a very confident person, but mm -hmm. I have people in multiple stages of my life tell me that I, I come across as cocky. So I struggle with it. If you've got any advice for me, please throw it my way. Like I said, you want to be your, you want, if that's who you are, then that's cool. You want to be your authentic self. And I'm going to tell you, I specialize in diversity and inclusion. And to be honest, a lot of times, right? I shouldn't say to be honest, because usually somebody's about to lie when they say that, but <laughs> at least that's, at least that's the thing. But a lot of times employers, and this is what I've noticed is if you're a woman, it comes across as being cocky. If you're a male, it comes across you of you being a leader, right? So I wouldn't change that. If that's who you are, if that's who you are, I wouldn't change that. You know, I would not change Thank that. You. When, when I say, <laughs> when I, I say, you so many years ago. No, serious. No, but that's no serious because that's actually you know, really validating to hear. I'm not going to lie. It's the truth. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen guys that would, you know, go on the job site. Oh, this is wrong. This is wrong. But then a female will come on the job site and say the same thing, but maybe a little bit nicer. Oh, she's <sighs> what's wrong with her? Like she is. You know, she's grouchy and it's just like, no, he she just said the same thing that he just said, but it's different. Right. So and those are the and those are the companies like and, and that's is that's the hard part about the not being cocky part. Right. Mm -hmm. If you go there and you're being your authentic, authentic self and they're giving you the looks like you can tell when somebody's like, yeah, you're being cocky. That's not the place for you anyway. Like I said, yeah. you're sizing them up. That's not the place for you. Well. So I have struggled with this and I will say the way that I try to avoid being cocky is n having information. If I know my shit and I'm confident about what I know and I've got resources to back it up, I've studied very carefully, right. I know what I'm talking about. That's one way to avoid it. The set, another way to avoid it is in how you deliver that information. So if you are on a job site or you're in an interview and you're like, oh yeah, I know everything. I know this, 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 this. Yeah. That's cool. But like it, it does, it certainly comes across as cocky and right. I think you need to prep you as in myself and whoever else needs to hear this need to practice active listening. That mm. is a, Ill, that I wish I had when I was in my early uh, 20s in like my eight, when I was 18 years old, 19 years old, 20 years old, you know, my my real dumb ages, my dumb <laughs> stage of life, we, we in case you were wondering. But seriously, I, I would say being an active listener is a really good way to avoid being cocky because you're reading the person across from you. You're looking at their body language. You're listening to what they have to say. You're listening to what problems that they have that they right. want solved in their company, or you're listening to not even a problem, just what it is that they're looking for and how you can contribute to that. Right. So know your shit, be an active listener. I'm glad and you, I'm glad you cursed because I was wondering, I was like, is this a, a cursing show? Okay, now I can relax. No, I'm kidding. I feel like I have a number three, but I can't think of it right now. So I'll just ask my next question. When a okay, I've seen like sample interview questions, and one of the biggest questions that people don't know how to answer is the infamous what is your biggest weakness? Do you answer that question? How do you expect people to answer that question? How should we answer that question? All right. I love the memes that come with this, though. Like, oh, my biggest weakness is caring too much. My biggest weakness is I just want a paycheck. You know, like, yeah. It's but seriously, seriously, how it's should you answer that question? It's a double-edged sword, right? Because it depends on the person that's asking you that question. If mm. I'm asking you this question, right, or somebody that's been in the game for a little bit, they really want to know it. They really want to know what your biggest weakness is. 
right? Mm -hmm. My biggest weakness is whenever I'm asked that question, my biggest weakness is screwing it up after it's already done. So I can have the best PowerPoint, the best PowerPoint, and it could be done. I'll go back and I'll add more stuff and I'll add more stuff and then I'll obsess over it, right? Because I want to make sure. So you're giving them that negative and a positive. You care about your work, but this is also a weakness, right? You care about it, but it's a weakness. So I'll, I'll say that and I'll just you know say things like I have a big problem with my work-life balance, but or however, I'm working on improving my work-life balance. I'm doing things like not bringing my laptop home every day. I'll do it when I need to, but I'm, but this is these are my actual struggles, right? So I would say you want to be real with them because it's like I said, it's just like a relationship. If I'm on a first date with somebody, I'm not going to necessarily ask them what their biggest weakness are, but if they say, "Hey, I love." to go and watch movies. I love to clean. I love to cook. I love to snowboard. And I'm an avid snowboarder. And three months down the road, I'm like, hey, it's time to go. And they don't want to go. Mm -hmm. And we, I found out that they don't like it. It's not, a, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, not, it doesn't fit. What are we doing here? So what is your biggest weakness? Or actually, let me switch it up. What are your top three weaknesses? I would say my top three, my top, not my number one weakness is as an, as a leader, I would say, hmm, that's good. You're calling me out. <laughs> All right. No, seriously. And, and I think a lot of leaders have this. And I think it's important for the workforce to know this. I would say, is the fear of being inadequate. Mm. I would say I that, that too, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think a, a lot of times in leadership we have this this fear that imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. Right? Imposter syndrome. Do I do I really know my stuff? Okay, I know it the book forwards and backwards, but you know, how am I really doing? So I would say mm -hmm. that's number 1. I would say number two is that whole work-life balance thing. And I'm, I'm trying to get better at that. And I would say um, number three is expecting everyone else to care as much about something as I do. Oh, yeah. That's a big one with me because with me, if I turn it in, I want it to be good. I want it to be good. And I've noticed in the past that I'll look at work of others and I'll say, oh, wow, uh, how long did it take you to do this? Right. And you know what I mean? And it's good, but it's not great. So I've struggled in the past of saying, you know what, this this is good. Thank you. I really appreciate you. Right. I really appreciate the effort that you put into doing this. Um, and I've noticed by doing that, that will bring that person to, to say, okay, cool, you you like that I'm doing this because a lot of times, you know, the people that work with you, they might not even, um, they might need that. They might need that push to get them through, right? They may might need that push to put them on the next level. What do you think about, what if you don't have the answer to a question in an interview? <laughs> That happens a lot. That that happens a lot. And uh, like I, like I said, I would be honest. I would be honest. I got some pretty bad advice uh, when I left the military. I was told, if you don't know the answer to a question, you need to you know make up something. That's what I was told at a transitional assistance program. You need terrible. to make up. <laughs> huh? Terrible advice. Terrible, terrible. And I used it. <laughs> I used it. I use it. The the finger bobble jig, you know, it's just it just makes you makes you look like a liar because mm -hmm. you can tell when not everybody can tell. But for the most part, you can tell when somebody's just feeding you um, a line of crap. I would be what honest. Are some, with you. What are some telltale signs that you're getting some BS from someone? 
I would normally I would say anybody other than me, they would say, um, um, and then it would look up <laughs> the whole hello darkness, my old friend. You could tell that they're they're trying to come up with something, right? Mm -hmm. And just the fact that it has nothing to do with it. I would just, if I was that person that didn't know the answer to a question, I would tell them, well, I believe based off of what I know that this would be the appropriate uh, response. However, you know, I would, I I tend to tap tap dance a little bit. You know, I tend to tap dance, but I will tell that that person that I really don't know. I really don't know. If it's something that I 100% don't know, I would say, I did not know the answer to that question. Right, right. So you talked about looking up and kind of pausing. Mm -hmm. What are some other messages that you receive based on someone's body language, good or bad? I would say there's some people that go on the interview and they're sitting like this. That's happened. <laughs> That's happened. I I can't. I a dude. Yeah, I even seen the dude. He, yeah, he put his foot, had his foot on the desk because he was like early and like no, like he, he was like probably about fifteen minutes. Or he had his foot on the desk and he's he's like texting. That's that's horrible. Um, oh my god. That, yeah, that's horrible body language. Um, so bad. For me, uh, for me, what I do is. I will make sure that I'm having, you know, good posture. I will sit up straight, shoulders back. And what I'll do is I'll usually, and I got this from the military. I usually take my hands and just put them, you know, a little bit like on, on my thigh and just sit straight up. And you can't go wrong with that. Leave your phone in the car because if you're messing with your phone at an interview, what that tells me is that you're going to be looking at your phone during your job. Okay, hold on real quick. I think it's fine to bring your phone into the interview as long as it's like in your bag or in your pocket because what if you have a interesting photo or video that you need to share with the recruiter? That's or good. Or is it better to bring in a laptop at that point? That's good. No, if you need to have that for that, I'm saying if you're one of those people that if you're one of those people that if you have spare time, yeah, just like that. Right before we went on, I was sitting here and I was doing exactly what you're doing right now with my phone, just kind of killing time a little bit, right? So, yeah, you see what I'm saying? Killing time a little bit. And then what happens, the person, it just, to me, it just throws you off your game. I would use that time to, uh, you know, think about some of the questions that you might get asked, some of the, you know, some of the things. I would just take that time to maybe write some some stuff down, write some thoughtful questions and just, mm. you know, you want to, I don't know, have the phone if you need it as a, as an aid for the interview, but you shouldn't be, you know, looking at Facebook or anything like that. But Definitely. Unless you're and, a social media creator and that's what your job is. Right. Right. Well, you know, it was actually good that you mentioned writing things down, writing down thoughtful questions because if you're doing that during the interview, that probably sends the message that you are prepared and that you, what the person is saying to you is important. So if you're asking your interviewer a question um, and, and they're answering you and you're writing it down because you genuinely need that information, that's probably gonna send a positive message to your interviewer. Right. Right. And a lot of times um, I've talked to a couple of individuals, they feel like that they need to go hip pocket. Right. They feel like that they shouldn't be writing stuff down or they shouldn't have it already prepared. And right. I think you're 100 percent right. That shows that you're prepared. That shows that you care. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. OK, so I, I had a question, but I'm mm -hmm. going to change it up. Okay, just real quick, while we've got the banner, let's just touch on what you should bring to an interview. You should be dressed like you want the job, like dress for the job you want. Right. Have a hard copy of your resume. Yeah, definitely. Hard copy of your, your resume. Um, 
depending on what job it is, you might want to have those that tangible portfolio. That's always good. Um, what I do a lot of times is I'll have letter of references, especially if you know they're really good reference letters. I'll bring those with me. And uh, something that I did when I got hired on with the Department of Defense, I knew that there was going to be a panel, right? And, and this is this is what I think is kind of another good hack, right? I knew that there was going to be a panel, so I went to Office Max and I told them I want presents because I. I really wanted this job, right? Yeah. So I was going all out. I told them that I want presentation style binded books and I got six of them. So I had my, I had a cover letter thanking them. I went on ahead, ahead of time and I got their individual names, right? So they had the individuals, right? And I gave it to them, thanking them and I appreciate them. My resume, letter of references, reference letters, and also, um, I think it was like a sample of my work. It was a sample of, you know, whatever work that I was doing. And I got the job. I got the job. One lady said, I had a bunch of questions to ask you, but I've never seen this before ever. I've mm. never seen this before. And she was just like, I, I can't believe it. They even like took pictures of it. So I would say, you don't necessarily have to go and get it, bind it and print it, but definitely you know, maybe do it like the old school uh, reports, right? Put it in uh, a small little clear or something and give it to the whoever is interviewing you. I think that will just an added little bonus. I think that'll pay big dividends. Hmm. Yeah. So you said it was a binder, like you got your resume, your cover letter, resume, letter, letters of recommendation, and samples of your work all bounded. Yeah, you got it for each yeah. person in the panel. Yeah. That yeah. is really incredible. That's yeah. a great idea. I actually take a like a pad folio to my interviews and I'll have sam I'll have copies of my resume. I'll have copies of my work. And um so my work isn't just computer uh it isn't just CAD drawings, it's also my technical writing, which has impressed people before. And it yeah. makes me really proud. It makes me really proud because that's something I never thought I would do. So I bring that with me. And I also, inside of my portfolio, have a scratch piece of paper that I can write questions to ask the interviewers. And I also write questions that I think they're going to ask me. So I'll ask questions or I'll write down questions that I think they're going to ask me so that I'm prepared to answer some pretty basic questions. I'll even make like a little box somewhere that says job story or job. What did I learn or, right. you know, story time and how did I contribute to the situation? How did I troubleshoot or problem solve? And I have those stories written down so that in the moment when I am kind of nervous, I don't forget. And I remember what it is I want them to know about me and then I can shine. And then I have the end of interview questions. So Tony, my next question for you is, what are some good end of interview questions that people should ask their interviewers? <sighs> I... I'm a firm believer in there, there's when I would first start interviewing for jobs, they would say, so Tony, do you have any questions? And I was just excited that it was over. Right. And I'm just like, oh, no, no questions. No, no mercy. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Mercy. But um, as I started to realize that, you know what? Like I said before, I am interviewing them. So you know what? They just gave it to me because they want to know who I am. I want to know who they are. I want to know who I'm talking to. So if there's a person that I'm going to be working for, I'll ask them, how long have you been working here? And then they'll say, however long. And I'll say, what what um, what keeps you here? Hmm. What keeps you here? That's a good one. Uh, yeah. By the way, if anybody is joining us live right now, feel free to put your questions in the comments so that I can ask Tony and we can answer live for you. And thank you to those who have been tuning in and watching this. Uh -huh. So continue. And I would say what I would ask them, what is your leadership style? 
that one is really important. Really important to me. What is your leadership style? And if I'm talking what, to the, your, what's your leadership style? I love it. Right. Yeah. And, and what, basically what keeps you coming to work every day? Do you love working here? Um, your boss, the person that you work for, do you like working for him or her? And I know those are sometimes those are like weird questions and it kind of put them on the spot. Um, but oh, well, you're interviewing them too. Yeah. I also ask them, do you have, you know, what about training? Do you guys offer training for this position? How will I be evaluated? What are my key performance indicators? What is ex expected of me? I would like to know because, you know, there's, there's certain jobs out there to where they just make it up on the fly. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm cool with that as long as that's spelled out to me initially. Right. Is it good to ask if there are opportunities for upward mobility? I think so because a, a good supervisor, I, I think so because a good supervisor um, is looking for the person that's going to replace them. Mm -hmm. That's, that's how I look at it. I look for somebody that is really good. Right. Really good. Or somebody that I can coach up to be really good. Right. And, and that's happened before where I'm just like, well, <laughs> um, you're doing all the work pretty much. I mean, you know, it's I, I think this person should get this position. You know, well, what about you? Maybe it's time for me to go someplace else or go to another department because I feel like this person is is, is capable. So as a good leader, I feel like as a learning leader or somebody that's aspiring to be a good leader, you have to be willing, be willing to give your people that upward mobility and provide that opportunity. Even if the company doesn't have it, you have to be that person that's pushing for it. Um, and yeah. maybe upward mobility isn't necessary. Like you don't always have to be looking for the next level up. You could always look for or ask about learning opportunities. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I've, um, cause not, I've, not all, like not all small businesses are going to be able to give you a pay raise, but right. they might invest in your training so that you can take on other responsibilities. And as someone who is looking for a job, those are things to consider, right? Cause if you are looking for, for a lot of learning opportunities and you're looking for a place that's going to invest in you and 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 certify you and a bunch of different stuff and you're going to get a bunch of cool like a lot of cool experience then that's a great employer to work for but if you're the type of person who wants to work up the corporate ladder and eventually become a c letter of the alphabet o <laughs> right yeah, then yeah. then that small employer may not be the place for you it just it right. depends on what you want and it depends on where you're at in your journey. So as an interviewee, it's important to assess those things. And it's important to have those really good end of interview questions. I agree. I agree. It's, like I said, it's just like a relationship. It is. It yeah. is. So speaking of relationships, actually, this has nothing to do with relationships, but <laughs> this is part of the interview process. Is sometimes they ask, what do you want to get paid? What are you, what wages are you expecting? What salary are you expecting? Or it's the question comes up in some form or another. So do you have any strategies for negotiating pay or even just some simple do's and don'ts? I don't, it's changed quite a bit. I mean, I know before, before maybe about 10 years ago, I would say never bring up pay, never bring it up. Yeah. No, I would say that. And I'm pretty sure, you know, that's something that a lot of people would say, but I would now, now, definitely it's up to you. Sometimes you can sometimes bring up pay from the initial conversation, right? Because I don't know if you've noticed, but the initial conversations, a lot of times with recruiters, they're asking you, how much do you get paid now? How much do you get paid right now? They're in business, right? I, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but that might be illegal to ask now. Well, they do it. They do it. Yeah. How? Um, there, there are. So just real quick, there are some questions that a recruiter cannot ask you. And one of them is, 
Like, do you plan to become a mother? Or, do you yeah. plan to raise a family? Do you plan how big like is your family? Right. How big is your family? Um, questions like that are you, what church are, do you go to? Pardon? What church do you go to? Yeah, what, what church do you go to? What's your religion? Like there are certain what? questions that um are either illegal for them to ask or are just straight up inappropriate and have nothing to do with your ability to contribute to their to their culture or to their work environment. So right. be be wary of that kind yeah, of thing. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And I, I think as as far as pay a lot, they'll say another way that they can get around with it, with it is what are you expecting as far as pay? Mm -hmm. What what are you expecting? And I would say so I answer that. I actually say, oh, what is what's your range? Because a lot of at least in my exp experience, a lot of employers, they have a range that they're working with. Right. So when they're asking you what you're expecting, they want to figure out if you are landing on the high or low end of their range. So then I will counter that question with a question. What is your, what is your range? And I also want to know the range because uh, I don't want, I, I don't want to earn less than my male counterparts, which I am lucky enough to have worked with several employers, if not all of my employers are equal um, and they pay people fairly, but it it does kind of suck that like I have to think about something like that. So it's real. Yeah. 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 It's real. No, it's real. You definitely, I think that's definitely a, a question to ask. And mm -hmm. I think it was Robin's story that made a post basically saying, yeah, acts away and if they're not willing to tell you that information then you know what go to the next go to the next employer because they're not worth your time anyway because this is a relationship you guys yep. are going to work together yep. um but, so this is actually a really good segue into the last topic i want to go over Bef when when you go into an interview i or before before anybody goes into an interview, I have a book that I recommend. It's called Never Split the Difference by Christopher Voss. And I read this book last year and it is full of great tips for negotiate. It's just about negotiation. Mm -hmm. So it's all about active listening. It's all about different strategies when you are negotiating your salary. Christopher Voss used to work for the FBI. He was like their top negotiator. So he talks about hostile wow. situations in which he actually had to negotiate with terrorist groups, domestic terrorists, foreign terrorists, hostage situations. Like, So is, it's, so is he making the, the potential employer into possible terror? Uh, <laughs> Is well, that how you the negotiation strategy? <laughs> no, but that but the same tactics that he uses in the FBI is related to what you can use and what would be effective in yeah. any any sort of interview. So this is a book I highly recommend to anybody if you're into you know reading and that sort of thing. Anyway, um, is there an audio book of it? <laughs> Probably I'm into listening. Probably, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Next, la, uh, blah, wow, words are hard. I know, right? Diversity inclusion. This is what you're all about. So let's take a few minutes to address this. I know you have a lot to say about it. So I'm going to just leave it up to you. If you want to talk about this topic from the recruiter's perspective or from the, from the interviewee's perspective, the, the mic is yours. All right. You're going to leave me with the with the stuff that could possibly get us in trouble. No, I'm just saying. No, so, this is what we're all about. No, yeah. So so this topic is is near and dear to my heart, right? And the reason why is I mean, obviously um I am a black male, right? Yep. What? Yeah, yeah, I am. I am. <laughs> yep. And yeah. And Man, I've been in the workforce, I mean, since I was 18, and I've seen it all. I've seen it all. And it's it's a lot of the things that go on in the workforce, it continue to go on because we don't speak up. We don't speak out. We make a lot of these, the, these things, these issues seem like it's that person's fault or that person's responsibility when it's the organization's responsibility, 
right? And that's one of the positive things that I like about, not like, but one of the positive things about this year. You're seeing a bunch of different organizations, um, not so much, not so much right now, right? Because it, it always seems like there's a, a pivotal point, you know, whether it's an election, whether, you know, someone just got killed, whether it's some violence to where these companies, they'll start saying, hey, we're a diverse uh, workforce. We love the workforce. I mean, we love diversity and, and inclusion, right? But what I think about diversity and inclusion, I think about right diversity. You have all of these different people, right? You have black people, you have white people, you have Asian people, you have Mexicans. Everybody, you have this just big range of people. LGBT, right? They all work for the organization. That's good. That's really good, right? So everybody is invited to the party. Mm-hmm. But in, and that's the diversity part. The inclusion part is, is everybody going to be able to play the games at the party? Okay. That's a good, it, you know, that's a really good way to think about it. Did I just drop some bombs? No, <laughs> no, but, no, but you know what I'm saying though? Is everybody yeah. going to be able to play? And, and that's our problem. That's our problem because not everybody is able to play, right? Mm -hmm. When you go and you apply for a job, right? You said it that you have to ask to make sure that you're getting as much as your male counterparts. I have been told in meetings before, how much did you offer? Oh, why did you offer that much? Well, because the last guy we offered him that much. Well, this is construction and that's a girl. You really think she has that experience? No. And I'm just like, no, asshole, you haven't seen her. You haven't even seen her resume. Oh my gosh. So, so yeah. there you go. And I think it's just, I don't know. I want, I want to make sure that the workforce is a better environment for my children. Right. I want to make sure that they don't have to go through the things that you and I have to go through the things that yeah. we don't even know that we're going through the things that are said, said behind closed doors. Right. Mm -hmm. So just on the, the female thing real quick, there was a comment that I saw on LinkedIn that I've been thinking about for a couple of weeks now. And some, it, some guy had commented on someone's post saying, gender shouldn't even be an issue at all. I treat everyone on my job site equally. And it's like, yes, you're right. Gender shouldn't be an issue. Just like race shouldn't be an issue or sexuality shouldn't be an issue or age shouldn't be an issue. You're right. None of that should be an issue, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Right. And yes, you may treat everyone equally, but does your colleague next to you do the same thing? Does exactly. the person who is hiring do the same thing? Does the person who is negotiating pay and salaries, are they doing the same thing? Cause that's not always the case. And it's, it, it's almost like it's not enough for you to do it. If you see someone in conversation or in action, not allowing people to play the game at the party, then you got to call them out. I agree. You've got to end to that behavior. There, I I, I, you know, I'm, sh I'm certain that behind my back, I'm sure people have said, oh, we need people to fulfill this rigging call. Who are we going to call? Oh, let me think. The top 10 people that I think about first and foremost are the big burly guys right. or the people who are very fast or, you know, like not to say that I'm not fast or can't keep up at my job. I do. I, I, I'm very um, aware of that because I want to validate myself and pay attention to like how much work or how many tasks are other guys accomplishing and can I keep up? And when I can, and it's a thing, it's a thing you know, that you I'm even like, have okay, to, yeah, yeah, no, I am, I am doing as much as they are. This right. isn't even right. a thing. Right. So. Right. Right. And it's a shame that you even have to do that. Yeah. You know what? So it's, it's really interesting. Like you, you would be surprised at how many negative thoughts you will catch yourself thinking mm -hmm. when I'm listening to the radio or a podcast, I will sometimes think, Oh, I think I prefer a male voice because it's more soothing, but it's like, wait a minute. How yeah. did I do that? that is 
so not true. I need to give right. this, this, you know, the, the person hosting this podcast is a female. I've got to at least listen and give it a chance because yeah. otherwise I'm letting some prejudice dictate my behavior. And that is, that's when it's not okay. So, you know, even I catch myself thinking those thoughts. We all I'm, do. Glad, I'm glad that you said that. I'm glad that you said that because this has been my experience The people that say, you know, I, I'm not prejudiced. I'm the least most racist person in the room. And, you know, when people yeah. say that kind of stuff, it's almost like, <laughs> you're probably the most racist person in the room to yeah. say that. But it's it's those biases that we yeah. all, those biases that we all have, I think is the, uh, there's a leadership institute. They they have this, this different, uh, this system. And what it is, is, and I'll, and I'll send you the information on it, but they're breaking down those biases that we all have, right? And getting away from the, Another favorite line of mine, not, or unfavorite line of mine, is I don't see color, and it's just like, okay, okay. If you did a little bit of research, when you say I don't see color or I don't see gender, unless you're colorblind or, or you're just blind for real, right? I see that you're a woman. You see that I'm a black male, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why do we need to pretend like we don't? And that doesn't mean that we're going to be negative about it, right? right? That's just the fact. That's just like on a construction site. How many times have you been on a construction site and you realize that your all of your PPE is for males? All the Mary? time. <laughs> yeah. All the time. And it's bullshit. It's bullshit. Why should you have to wear a uh, friggin' small, medium, large men's clothing? That's not. That's not okay. Yeah, that's yeah. not OK. And that's to me, that's what that means is that's what when I think of, that's what I think about when I, I don't see color. I don't I'm colorblind and I don't see gender. It's bullshit because we all do. Yeah. When people say when people say I don't see gender because that's gender is the one that affects me. That's that's my like minority status. I don't feel mm -hmm. like a minority at all, but you know, that is like the label if you want to put it right. on. Right. So when I hear like, I don't see gender, what that, what my brain is telling me is, okay, you see that I'm a woman, but you don't see the inequality that I've had to go through. You don't see the sexual harassment that I've been through and you certainly don't see the sexual harassment that other women have gone through at work or off the job site by their coworkers. And it happens. So when you say, I don't see gender, it's almost like you're gaslighting me. No, that stuff doesn't happen to you because it doesn't yeah. know gender. I don't yeah. see gender. Like, I understand the intention and it's, it comes from good intention. But again, it's, it, it's like gaslighting. It's, it's like yeah. you're telling me that my experience isn't real and that it doesn't happen. And it does. Yeah. And I have stories and I have female friends who have stories. And so I can only imagine that if you're a person of color, that's, yeah. That's probably how it feels as well. Oh, I mean, I don't know, but no, 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 no. Hey, when you start talking about the stuff that you're seeing on LinkedIn, I honestly thought you were looking at one of my feeds. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, any for any of your listeners right now, go look at my page. Oh my God, look at my page. I yeah. mean, there's literally hundreds of thousands, hundreds and thousands of racist, gender insensitive comments. It's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's ridiculous. And don't you dare, don't you dare say something positive about a woman on LinkedIn. Don't you dare do it. Don't you dare say, congratulate a woman for being the first, right? Because that's, that's bad. And that, that's, that's really bad. And what that does is that hurts other people's feelings because they automatically start thinking, that the reason that they're in that position is because they're the first when I'm saying, so do you really think that that was the first person that was qualified to do the job? No, that's the first person that they've allowed to do the job. 
So mm -hmm. therefore I will continue to celebrate the first. I will continue to keep celebrating that and, and be part of the solution of diversity and inclusion. It needs to be celebrated. I will yeah. not be quiet on that ever, yeah. ever. And I get hundreds of hate mail daily, hundreds of pieces of hate mail daily because of that. And mm -hmm. it's just, it's sick. It's sick and it's very indicative of the workplace. Here's one that really, really irks me. Coming from my experience, I learned how to rig under someone who taught me. And one day I said, hey, why did you decide to take me under your wing? Did you see that I was an intelligent person? Did you see the potential in me? Was it my passion, my eagerness to learn? Like, what was it that made you want to teach me? And he goes, honestly, I just wanted to stare at your tits. I figured you'd get bored and then we'd be done with it. And so that is a crushing thing to hear. So fast forward to I get a job. Oh my God. Uh, very, I, I get a job with an employer. And in, in that process, I was interviewed by several people. So it wasn't like an easy job to get. But when I get there, I hear rumors circulating that I'm only, you know, I'm, I'm only there because I slept with so-and-so, or I'm only there because I'm trying to, I sleep around with management, which is, is, couldn't be further from the truth. God and forbid then, you know how to do your job. Fast right? forward a little bit more, fast forward a little bit more. I no longer work with that employer. And I, so, so I'm not working for that employer. And one of the managers who is also no longer working for that employer. And I go to hang out and I'm thinking it's going to be platonic and neither of us work for that employer anymore. So you'd think that's all behind us. And, right. and at some point him and I are sharing a, we're having lunch and he puts my hair behind my ear and goes, you are so beautiful or something like that. And I was just like, wait a minute. So do you do that with <laughs> Bob too? I'm yeah. like, don't say that about me because this guy said things about me, like, yeah. like expressed his attract his attraction to me, or did other people express their attraction to me? But then yeah. I'm the one who gets the the horrible rumors spread about me. So I it's I, yeah. there are I have I have several stories and like that, and it makes me question: Am I here because I'm pretty? Am I here because I've got you know a set of fat? fatty tissue that uh, lactates when I have a baby, like what? Yeah, no, it's a weird work coach. And how many guys yeah. do you, how many guys do you think have been accused of sleeping their way up to the top? Probably close to none. There you go. Yeah. There you go. So that's why we, that's why I think it's important to celebrate the milestones. That's why it's important to just keep going and keep this discussion going, even if it make yeah. people uncomfortable, you know, and this whole diversity and inclusion topic has been relegated to politics and, you know, not talking politics. And, and it just, that irks me like 100% because it's just like, so the fact that I want to be treated like a human, the fact that I want my all, I want all of my peers to be treated like humans, now that's your politics. Now you've put that under a subject to where we can't talk about it. Why is that? Why? Mm -hmm. It's the same reason, okay, why you can't talk about, and this is just me thinking, why you can't talk about pay at work? Why, why do you think you can't talk about pay at work? Hmm, probably because there's a, probably a group of people at those jobs that aren't getting paid as much as the man. And that's just being real. Some people will say that this is complaining. Some people will say have thicker skin, but I guarantee you it's not the people. It's not the people that fall in those categories that this mm -hmm. is being, that this is happening to, because it's just like the fox and the wolf, the wolf, there's no danger here or the bunny, the, 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 the bunny and the fox, right? The fox okay. hunt the bunny. Okay. The bunny is terrified because the fox is going to eat him. But the fox, uh, yeah. the fox is saying, there's no problem here. I don't see a problem, but the bunny is fucking yeah. terrified. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. 
So mm-hmm. like I, I like I don't want to promote like a victimhood mentality. Mm-hmm. Um, oh my gosh, I have so many thoughts right now. I don't want to promote a victimhood mentality, but when you are the type of person who's like, I don't see a problem, you are gaslighting and you are minimizing things that actually exist. Right. 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 And you want to just be treated like a human. I just want to be at my work and be hired for jobs, knowing that it's because I am perfectly 110% capable of doing that goddamn job. Yeah. It's not because I'm beautiful. I know I'm beautiful. Okay. I'm not even going to lie. I know I'm pretty. Okay. <laughs> but that's why you should hire me. I know I'm a woman and you don't need to hire me just because I'm a woman, just because you want to be a diverse workforce, but you should be a diverse workforce and you should hire me because I know my shit. Yeah. Right. And uh, one thing that irks me is when people say, Oh, the only reason why that kid got into that school or why that person got into that job is because they're black. How about it's because they actually are qualified to do that job. Yeah. Right. And they, and they have the degrees, the certifications, yeah. and the experience. How about that? Yeah, that's, How about part that? Of, that's part of the whole inclusion thing. Like, the diversity is like step one. Mm-hmm. Inclusion is the next step up, right? And yeah. don't spread rumors. Just go talk to that person in person. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, we could totally have a whole segment just on this topic. But for now, we are well over our hour allotment time. And I really appreciate having you here. If y'all are watching the replay, you can check out Tony on all of his social media platforms, Tony Taylor. And he has a link tree. Just go to link tree forward slash Tony Taylor inspires. And he is happy to answer any of your questions. He's happy to help you out, do any mock interviews. Tony's a great guy. I know it because I get to talk to him and he's on my LinkedIn and we're doing this and I'm really excited. Like, I love Tony. You should get a hold of him too. And <laughs> I appreciate you saying that. And don't forget to subscribe on Industry Explorers on YouTube. I keep telling my boyfriend that if I get 100 subscribers, I'll eat this really spicy chip that he bought. It comes in a box. Don't and it is it. One, <laughs> single chip, one single chip. I go, Dan, I will eat that chip and I will live stream it when I get 100 YouTube subscribers. So there you go, everybody. Um, you know what? I might, I, might, I might force the issue and tell everybody to go ahead and do it so we can see that live. I, I'm really <laughs> curious about this chip. I want it to make me cry. I want it to make me hurt. So please help me get to 100 subscribers so that I can experience this because I'm very intrigued. So, Tony, any any final thoughts? No, that's it. Um, I think we said everything. I think I think we said everything. If uh, Again, if there's any questions, just go ahead and reach out to me. Your friend, Tony. I did that. That was pretty cool. Anyway, <laughs> but yeah, this is great. And I appreciate you for doing this for, um, I know the origin of why you created uh, Industry Explorers. I think that it is an amazing and amazing gesture. You could be doing anything in the world, but you're doing this for other people. So I just wanted to tell you, thank you for that. Thank you so much. I, I hope to just continue growing and continue inspiring and helping people out with whatever it is they need help with. So there you go. All right, explorers. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for catching the replay. I will see you on our next adventurous journey. Take care, everybody.